Hi class, how are you today? That's bad. That sounds pretty bad. I'm sorry. The learning target for today is to be able to compare and contrast types of studies. For the scale, you're three if you can compare and contrast types of studies. Two, you can compare and contrast most types of studies. One, you can compare or contrast some types of studies, and zero, you cannot compare or contrast types of studies. Let's get started. Section 1.3, Introduction to Experimental Design. Focus points for this lesson. Discuss what it means to take a census. Describe simulations, observational studies, and experiments. Identify control groups, placebo effects, completely randomized experiments, and randomized block exper experiments. And discuss potential pitfalls that might make your data unreliable. Planning a statistical study. Planning a statistical study and gathering data are essential components of obtaining reliable information. Depending on the nature of the statistical study, a great deal of expertise and resources may be required during the planning stage. In this section, we look at some of the basics of planning a statistical study. So a statistical study is more than just passing out a survey or something as simple as that. There's a long process to go through. Procedure for that. First thing you want to do is identify the individuals or objects of interest. You want to figure out who you're studying. Then, second step, figure out the variables and how you're going to uh, observe or take measurements of those variables. Step three, are you going to use a population or a sample? And if you are, which sampling method are you going to use? Step four, you want to address things like ethics, confidentiality, privacy, how are you going to deal with those, and also uh, getting permission slips if necessary. A lot of studies you need to get a permission slip first, especially if you're dealing with underage and then you need a permission slip from their parents. Step five, collect the data in whatever method you've already stated. Step six, figure out how you're going to uh, show your stats, whether it's in a graph of some sort, and those kind of things we'll talk about in future chapters. And how are you going to use inferential statistics to come to a conclusion? So which method are you going to use there? And we'll be dealing with those towards the end of the unit towards the end of the year. And finally, after you've done the study, note any concerns you have about your data collection and any recommendations you want to give for future studies. Usually, a lot of times when you have a statistical study like this, you write a paper or a report of some sort. So in a census, measurements or observations from the entire population are used. If you know uh, the census that happens every 10 years, the United States Census, what they do is they have people from go to, they, they send mail to everybody and then if they don't get the mail back, they actually go to their houses. They want information from everybody, every single person. They want to know about them. So... That's why they do it every 10 years, because it's so time-consuming to get data from millions of people and then deal with all that data. But they do it every 10 years just so we have the information to use. So a census actually does take the entire population. Usually what you have, though, is a sample. And we've talked about samples a lot already. Uh, they're only from part of the population. Um, so if you're only using part, you're saying it's a sample. But if you used everybody or every object in what you're studying, then it's a census. Experiments and observation. 
When gathering data for a statistical study, we want to distinguish between observational studies and experiments. In an observational study, observations and measurements are, of individuals are conducted in a way that doesn't change the response or the variable being measured. So this is like giving a survey or actually watching how something happens. In an experiment, a treatment is deliberately imposed on the individuals in order to observe a possible change in their response or variable being measured. So in this case, you're actually changing the environment some way. Uh, oftentimes this is used in uh, giving drugs. You give uh, a, a specific drug to a patient to see how it works. In that way, it's an experiment. So if you're not changing anything, you're just observing, it's an observational study. If you change something, it's an experiment. In 1778, Captain James Cook landed in what we now call the Hawaiian Islands. He gave the islanders a present of several goats, and over the years these animals multiplied into wild herds totaling several thousand. They eat almost anything, including the, most, uh, the famous silver sword plant, which was once unique to Hawaii. At one time, the silver sword grew abundantly on the island of Maui. In Haleakala, sure, a national park on that island, the silver sword can be still found. But each year there seemed to be fewer and fewer plants. Biologists suspected that the goats were partially responsible for the decline in the number of plants and conducted a statistical study that verified their theory. To test the theory, park biologists set up stations in remote areas of Haleakala, if you say so. At each station, two plots of land similar in soil conditions, climate, and plant count were selected. One plot was fenced to keep out the goats, while the other was not. At regular intervals, a plant count was made in each plot, this study involved an experiment because a treatment, the fence, was imposed on one plot. So adding the fence was your treatment. If all you did was just watch the plants and make observations that way, even though you were still collecting data, you didn't change anything, so it's still an observation. Putting in the fence made it an experiment because you changed something about it. The experiment involved two plots at each station. The plot that was not fenced represented the control plot. This was the plot on which a treatment was specifically not imposed, although the plot was similar to the fence plot in every other way. So the control plot, also known as a control group, is a way to see what your change did. So putting in the fence shows how effective the fence is by looking at the difference between what happened to the control plot. If they were the same, obviously not the fence changed nothing. But seeing how much change makes the, having the control plot very important. Statistical experiments are commonly used to determine the effect of a treatment. However, the design of the experiment needs to control for other possible causes of the effect. For instance, in medical experiments, the placebo effect is the improvement or change that the result of patients just believing in the treatment, whether or not the treatment itself is effective. The placebo effect occurs when a sub subject receives no treatment, but incorrectly, believes he or she is in fact receiving treatment and responds favorably. To account for the placebo effect, patients are divided into two groups. One group receives the prescribed treatment. The other group, called the control group, receives a dummy or placebo treatment that is disgu disguised to look like the real treatment. So this is just a type of control group that allows to uh, take into the fact that 
if you give someone medicine and you tell them it's going to work, even if it's not medicine, they might think it's working. So this makes up for that effect because if you just have a regular control group, you're saying they're not getting the medicine, so they're not having that, oh, I think it's working. So it takes out one possible error from that. Finally, after the treatment cycle, the medical condition of the patient patients in the treatment group is compared to that of the patients in the control group. A common way to assign patients to, a, to treatment and control groups is by using a random process. This is the, the essence of a completely randomized experiment. A completely randomized experiment is one in which a random process is used to assign each individual to one of the treatments. So you can't just say, oh, I'll take this guy, this guy, and this guy for the placebo group and the other three for the control group. You have to randomize it in some random way, like using a computer or a random number table or a calculator. Can chest pain be relieved by drilling holes in the heart? For more than a decade, surgeons have been using a laser procedure to drill holes in the heart. Many patients report a lasting and dramatic decrease in angina, chest pain, system, symptoms. Is the relief due to the procedure or is it a placebo effect? A recent research project at Lenitz Hill Hospital in New York, New York City provided some information about this issue by using a completely randomized experiment. The laser treatment was applied through a less invasive process. A group of 298 volunteers with severe, untreatable chest pain were randomly assigned to get the laser or not. <coughs> the patients were sedated but awake. They could hear the doctors discuss the laser process. Each patient thought he or she was receiving the treatment. Patients with chest pain and then into random assignments. So what's happening here is they're splitting the group, group one and group two, and that way group one gets uh, the treatment, the laser holes in the heart, group two gets no laser holes in the heart, and then they compare the pain relief of the two groups. The laser patients did well, but shockingly, the placebo group showed more improvement in pain relief. The medical impacts of this study are still being investigated. So even though patients over the years have said that the laser holes did really well, that, uh, the pa that their pain went away, it turned out that it was actually more the, of the placebo effect. They were told that this was going to make the pain go away, so their brain actually made them feel the pain less. So that was a good way to show that the placebo effect actually does a lot more than you think it might. And it also showed us that the laser holes in the heart Maybe not a good idea, but as it says, still being investigated. It is difficult to control all the variables that might influence the response to a treatment. One way to control some of the variables is through blocking. A block is a group of individuals sharing some common features that might affect the treatment. In a randomized block experiment, individuals are first sorted into blocks and then a random process is used to assign each individual into a block of, of one of the treatments. This allows them to see other things that might affect other than the placebo effect and get them into a specific group. There is a control group. The group receives a dummy treatment enabling the researchers to control for the placebo effect. In general, a control group is used to account for the influence of other known or unknown variables that might be underlying cause 
of a change in response in the experimental group. Such variables are called lurking or confounding variables. So lurking variables will show up a lot when you're dealing with a correlation that turns out not to be a causation. So lurking variables just show up a lot and it's actually two things are not actually causing each other. Randomization is used to assign individuals to two treatment groups. This helps prevent bias in selecting members for each group. Replication of the experiment on many patients reduces the possibility that differences in pain relief for the two groups occurred by chance alone. Whenever creating an experiment, you always want to make sure that, it's a, that it can be replicated, that other people can do it on, on their own and get the same effects you did. Surveys. Once you decide whether you're going to use sampling, census, observation, or experiments, a common means to gather data about people is to ask them questions. This process is the essence of surveying. Sometimes the possible responses are simply yes or no. Other times the respondents choose a number on a scale that represents their feelings from, say, strongly disagree to strongly agree. Such a scale is called a Likert scale. In the case of an open-ended discussion type response, the researcher must determine a way to convert the response to a category or number. A number of issues can arise when using a survey. So we talked a little bit about this when dealing with whether a ranking system would be ordinal or interval. Different things can mean different things to different people. So if you're talking about one word, it could mean something to one person, something different to someone else, and they're very subjective. Um, so that's a key thing with looking at surveys lots of errors can happen with them. Here are some pitfalls. Non-response. You can't contact people, you can't get people to participate. Truthfulness of response. They may lie about what's going on or may not remember correctly. Uh, same, faulty recall. Uh, they may not remember exactly what took place. Hidden bias. The way you word uh, stuff is very important. So if you word it a specific way, they, the people taking the survey may lean towards a specific uh, response. Vague wording, wording, as I said, wor some words mean different things to different people. So try to be as specific as possible in your surveys. Interviewer influence. So the way an interviewer is asking the questions uh, or even who they are may change a person's response. Uh, a common example of this is getting calls uh, about, about uh, political uh, agendas or political things going on can't think at the moment. I apologize. But anyway, so say you get a call from a political candidate uh, or people working for a political candidate and they ask you a bunch of questions including which candidate are you going to be voting for or do you want to vote for? And if you haven't completely made up your mind you may, to make them happy, say that you want to uh, vote for their candidate. So that's a common way of having that happen. Uh, and voluntary response. You may only get uh, responses from people who feel strongly about what's going on. So if your survey is towards a certain thing, you may only get response from the more vocal people about it. And you might not get responses from people who um, may not be very vocal about it, but still have opinions. Sometimes our goal is to understand the cause and effect 
relationships between two or more variables. Such studies can be complicated by lurking variables or confounding variables, as we mentioned before. A lurking variable is one in, for which no data have been collected, but nevertheless has an influence on other variables in the study. Two variables are confounded when the effects of one cannot be distinguished from the effects of another. Confounding variables may be part of the study, or they may, may be outside lurking variables. So if you remember that uh, 50 mis science misconceptions video, uh, the, there may have been a correlation between corn dog sales and heat, but the lurking variable in that case was the state fair. Choosing data collection techniques. We briefly discussed three common techniques for gathering data, observational studies, experiments, and surveys. Which technique is the best? The answer depends on number of variables of interest and the level of confidence needed regarding statements of relationships among the variables. Surveys may be the best for gathering information across a wide range of many variables. Many questions can be included in a survey, however, great care must be taken in the construction of a survey, of the survey instrument, and in the administration of the survey. Non-response and other issues discussed earlier can introduce bias. So if you create a survey, that's great. You can get a lot of information about, uh, about topics using a survey. However, you got to be very specific and very careful about how you create the survey. Observational studies are the, net, are the net's most convenient technique for gathering information on many variables. Protocols for taking measurements or recording observations need to be specified carefully. And observational studies isn't always just you sitting and watching something. It could actually be looking up information on a database or something to that effect. Experiments are the most stringent and restrictive data gathering technique. They can be time-consuming, expensive, and difficult to administer. In experiments, the goal is often to study the effects of changing only one variable at a time. Because of the requirements, the number of variables may be more limited. Experiments must be designed carefully to ensure that the resulting data are relevant to the research questions. So, no matter what data collection technique you use, you always have to be very specific and very careful about what you do, or a number of problems could arise uh, to make your data not actually what you want it to be, or even not actually be true and not show anything or show the wrong thing. All right, now time for the sponge. Once again, we have some questions here. Please answer them along with explaining wherever it says explain. So number one, determine if each study involved a sample or a census. So is example A involving a sample or is it involving a census? Same for B. And explain your answers as well. Number two, determine if each study used a completely randomized experiment or a randomized block experiment. And then explain. And number three, explain the difference between using a placebo and using a control group. That's it for the lesson. Once again, please make sure to take notes on the entire lesson, attempt the sponge, take a picture or video of everything, and submit it all to Doodle Classroom. And have a good night.